I, no, I'm good. I well, hope I did this right. Mike's right. Oops. Welcome to the Tuesday, March 11th, 2014 meeting, regular business meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, so I believe we have one uh, adjustment to the agenda to start out with um, item 6G. Um, we will um, strike from the agenda. G. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to um, just make a comment on um, public comments. We do have a, a, an opportunity for public comment um, tonight on agenda items. Um, there may be people here tonight to, to make public comment uh, related to, to uh, budget items. The school budget is not on our agenda tonight. Um, uh, if you took the trouble to come out, we'd be glad to hear from you, and so we'll, we'll make an exception to, to that um, typical practice um, uh, when we get to that, that part of the agenda. Uh, our budget meetings are scheduled for March uh, 18th, March 25th, and March 27th. The March 18th meeting is the budget meeting in which we address um, staff salaries and benefits issues. Um, which is um, which is an important part of the of the, of the budget um, and uh, potentially the, the the part of the budget that's relevant to the folks who might want to be here or who are here tonight to speak. So uh, March 18th again, and those budget meetings are run by our finance chair Michael Moore, and they take place in the high school library. Um, all of those videotaped and available on the school board website. Um, so that said. We will move on to item two, the approval of the school board minutes. Uh, may I have a motion? I move we approve the school board minutes from the executive session Tuesday, February 11th, 2014, regular business meeting Tuesday, February 11th, 2014, and workshop Tuesday, February 25th, 2014. Is there second. A second. Joe. Is there any discussion of the minutes? Everybody's comfortable with the contents of the minutes? Okay, all those in favor? Zero. Item three, comments from our student representatives. Tim. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so um, a couple things have happened in the high school so far. We finished our winter sports season and I think we were very successful. I think we got a lot of um, sportsmanship awards and we, we did really well overall and it was a, just a lot of fun to watch all the games. Um, we just finished our um, one act presentation which was a very, we had a very fun time at the one act festival. I, I wasn't part of it but they had a very fun time. And um, yeah, so that was good. Um, the seniors are preparing to kind of make decisions in terms of colleges and that sort of thing, which is very exciting. The um, AP government classes are going to go to Washington, I think maybe next week. And that's going to be really fun. And I'm really excited to head off there and we get to go see the White House, which I think will be really, really cool. And so, and then spring sports are going to happen soon and are starting to kind of develop. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Are there any questions for the student council representative? I'd love to just, I think I read this or when you mentioned the sportsmanship, is that the Cape boys basketball team got the MPA sportsmanship award? Yeah, I heard that. Just wanted to highlight that. That's pretty cool. All right, thank you. 
All right, so moving on, item four, comments from the public on agenda items. Is there anyone here tonight who would like to comment on items on our agenda or budget items if not? Yes, sir. Hi, Scott. Hey there. You must Thank be you. here for the budget Thank because <laughs> it's the only time of year we get flowers. I think I've got enough for each one of you. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, this is the, the start of what I look at as uh, a whole new era um, in the, uh, the high school health and phys ed department. Um, we have a person that uh, has been with the Cape Elizabeth schools since 1970, um, has taught many of the students' parents, several of their grandparents, <laughs> um, and basically has had a positive effect on the community uh, for decades and decades and decades. Um, and it, it really is one of those special times that um, you really need to see that she's uh, thinking about herself a little bit um, doesn't happen a whole lot uh, and pretty tough I think for me to see um, but I definitely think it's worth bringing to the attention um, that there hasn't really been a day I don't think um, there hasn't been really um, a year in her career and there hasn't probably been a student that she hasn't had a positive effect on, um, that she's had uh, the privilege of, of working with at the school, um, as well as the numerous teachers and, and administrators uh, and school boards uh, that she, she's been uh, associated with. So I just want to take the time before it gets too busy at the end of the school year um, with a lot of other things going on to recognize all that she's done for the community and just have Andrea Care just come forward, please. I will only say that Scott picked me up. He's got to come in here tonight. I'm totally caught off guard. Um, I just want to thank everyone for the wonderful experience that I've had here in Cape Elizabeth for so many years. And I don't have a speech prepared. I'm pretty you know, speechless right now, which most of my students know doesn't happen very often. Uh, but what I want to say to them, because there's a nice group of students here, is that um, you never know what's going to happen in your life. And when I signed my contract back in March or April of 1970 here at Cape Elizabeth, at 22 years old, I never ever dreamed I'd still be here in this marvelous place. And that, that really says to those of you who are here who are seniors that who knows in four to five years what will be your start um, for your life and for your life's work. I always consider this, it's not a job, it's not even a career, it's just been a life and it's been wonderful and uh, thanks everybody for the support and Scott, thank you so much for acknowledging me and Andy, thank you for your love and Jeff and so many people are sitting here who I've had the pleasure of teaching in addition to all the wonderful students up in the back and everywhere, thank you so much, it's been wonderful, thank you, you have a beautiful community. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Andrea. And I'm, I've never had the chance to work closely with you, Andrea, but I did witness um, the, the CIFA Ward breakfast last fall when, when the uh, outpouring of support that you received there. And, and, and uh, so I regret not having had that, that opportunity. But thank you very much for your service. Uh, I was kind of hoping this wouldn't be caught on TV. <laughs> Are you speaking or? I actually, I wouldn't like to speak. Okay. I, I don't know if somebody else had something while I clean up my little, my little messy. Uh, 
I'll cover for you, David. Okay. Um, I just want to say that I've, I've had um, the pleasure of working with Andrea Kerr with um, the group of Hope and the, the complete love that she has for the youth in our community just flows out of almost every word and every gesture she's ever said. So I just really want to thank you for taking such good care of our students all these years. You're welcome, Andrea. I just have to add, um, I know she has the school day, but on top of Hope, she also does the National Helpers, where I've seen her at 3 in the morning, um, picking up children to, from her. Who, who wouldn't miss her National Helper uh, sleepover, night uh, retreat together to go to another event? And there's Andrea at 3 in the morning, just with a smile on. And of course, I was. Um, oh, she doesn't have to go because I don't want to, everyone will be sleeping. Oh no, Andrea will be up um, making sure the kids get their needs met. And, um, and then the wellness committee, all you work on the wellness committees um, for over the years. Thank you very much. David? Uh, I just have a quick story. I remember when my son was a freshman, I went to Parents' Day and met a lot of impressive teachers, Dr. Efron and one of my favorites, Elaine Brownell. And I remember the last one was um, this young lady, and of course she taught. And I remember coming out of there going, oh my God, she blew me away. This is one of the brightest, nicest, kindest. I mean, I, you can't picture. I went up to Jeff Shitt and said, I don't know how you got her for this job, but this woman is perfect. And, she, and Dr. Reverend probably beat me up. Actually, he can't, but uh, <laughs> you were easily the most impressive person I met that day. And I met a lot of impressive people. Thank you. Do we have other comments from the public on school board agenda items? Seeing none, um, I will move on to communications. And I'm, I'm not seeing the sig signal from our distinguished state representative yet. So we'll go right to item B. Thank you for tying So you've already heard about the first one. Andrea Kerr, after 40 years with the district, will be retiring this June. And um, as you've heard from several people already, that's a great loss to the community. And um, we're, we're very happy for her as she moves on to the next chapter, but she will be sorely missed. Um, in addition, we are um, losing this year to retirement Suzanne Janelle, who has been with the district 25 years as a world language teacher. Um, this year, she has taken on our second grade students in addition to um, years of experience at both at Pond Cove and at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Suzanne was here, was hired the year after um, the FLESH program was introduced for elementary world language. So she has a long history um, with a department that has all, a, a good history for longevity all um, in and of itself. And then our third retirement this year is Linda Paul, kindergarten teacher from Pond Cove, who has been with the district as a kindergarten teacher for 16 years and another uh, six and a half years as an ed tech prior to that. Um, again, she, uh, I happen to be the parent of a kindergartner who has her this year and I can tell you that her enthusiasm and love for education haven't waned at all um, over the years and so we are sorry to see them all go and we wish them all the very best in their next chapter. And I believe the board's recognition of retirees usually occurs at the June school that, board meeting. Yes, that is right. So we, we're, we're better prepared in June to to, um, to do, do justice to what is uh, just added up 87 years of service to the district in, in one quick announcement. So um, we look forward to celebrating that in June. Next Thank item. Thank you. Next item. So should we move on to the NECAP report? Yes. Prepared for that? Yeah, let's move on to NECAP. Okay. I can see to plug in. Yeah, probably upside down. That'll work better. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Just put together. Does anyone need a copy I'll of the presentation? Copy. I'll pass that way. So this is the last year of NECAP. 
um, across New England. NECAP is the New England Comprehensive Assessment Program. Maine started using this as an assessment um, tool for grades three through eight in 2010. And just when you thought you got to know the test, it's changing. So this will be the last year that we report on NECAP results as the state has chosen to adopt Smarter Balance uh, moving forward. And I'll speak about that a little bit more at the end. So again, this is our fifth year of NECAP. We have more data trends. You can begin to build a picture of where we're strong and where we have some work to do as you look at sort of results over time. But don't look too closely because we're shifting gears. Um, you know, I, I will note this isn't evident necessarily always to members of the public, but different areas of writing are assessed each year of the NECAP exam. It might be um, response to literary text one year, it might be response to informational text another year. So the types of writing that students are asked to do vary from year to year, so you're not always making sort of apples to apples comparisons as you look at the history of writing. Ooh, whoa. Um, these are our 2013. The assessment is given in October and we get the results in February. So these are our results for 2013. This is a summary of our grades three through five, so they're combined results. Level four is what we call proficient with distinction and level three is what we call proficient. So levels three and four are meeting or exceeding the standards. Levels one and two are approaching um, but not yet meeting the standards. So as you can see in reading, 87% of the students at Pond Cove are meeting or exceeding the standards. In mathematics, you can see that we have 80% 80, 80 of our students meeting or exceeding the standards. And in writing, 56% of our students are meeting or exceeding the standards. And I'll put that into context, context for you a little bit later as you look at some comparative information. Over five years, if you look at those combined um, groups, students meeting or exceeding the standards as established by the state, Pond Cove has held um, fairly flat, some wanes over the years, but as you look at um, size of cohort groups, percentage of students participating, those numbers are not um, significantly, thank you Kim, statistically significant. Um, again, a range of from 85, 83, 86, 89, and 87 um, this year. So fairly flat performance in reading. Uh, that slide appears to be slightly cut off. I'm not sure if you can see the bottom row, so I'll, I'll speak to that. In math, um, again, we've seen fairly flat performance of students meeting or exceeding standards. So 82% um, in 2009, the base year, um, 83, 85, 86, and 80 in the present year. Remember that when these assessments are given, different groups of students are assessed each year. <laughs> so third grade students assessed this year are not the same third grade students assessed the following year. We track, you can track the students assessed over time. So the students, current seventh graders were third graders in 2003. Yes, that's correct. Um, but, but this really isn't designed to give cohort history. It's, to, it's really a year by year look at school performance. So to see that type of variation is not uncommon. As we look at Cape Elizabeth Middle School, and here, while we assess students in grades five through eight, they're assessed on the end of the prior year's perf performance. It's the, the end of fourth grade standards for fifth grade students, the end of um, seventh grade standards for our eighth grade students. So in mathematics, you can see we have 88% of our students, I'm sorry, that's reading in the past, first category, 88% um, of our students meeting or exceeding the standards at Cape Elizabeth Middle School for reading this year. We have 80% of our students, same percentages at Pond Cove, uh, meeting or exceeding the standards in mathematics, and 60% of our students meeting or exceeding the standards in writing. Again, writing is assessed only in grades five and eight. If we look at the five-year trends, again, excuse me, fairly flat performance over time. Um, holding steady in that 87, 88 range. Again, slight fluctuation, but the numbers of students in the grade levels vary from year to year, which account for, that could be a one student difference in some cases. Mathematics, also fairly flat performance over time. Um, the variation ranging from 82, 83, 85, 83, 80. Um, so to 
again, to sort of contextualize this information, you look not only at your local data, but you look at what's going on in other districts that you consider to be comparative. Um, in Cape Elizabeth, some of the districts that we look to most frequently are Yarmouth, Falmouth, and MSAD 51, which is Cumberland, North Yarmouth, including um, Greeley High School. So as we look at the comparative scores for grades three through eight, these are what are called summary scores. So these are the combined totals across those grade levels. Um, you can see, oh, you can't see Cape Elizabeth. We're on the bottom. <laughs> Not sure I can adjust that. We'll come back to that in a minute. I can tell you from my slide what it says. Yours is open. Um, so we're at 87%. Um, again, right in that range with those other comparative districts. In mathematics, we're at 80%, slightly below this particular year, those other districts. But again, the 82% and 80% are not statistically significant differences based on the size of the cohort. And in writing, um, we had the lowest score this year of 58%. And um, I'll speak more to that as we move forward in just a moment. So looking at data is also useful to sort of look at student performance over time. As we look at reading performance data in our current six graders, who were fourth graders in 2011, you can see that between 2011 and 2013, they've made 11 points as a cohort group gain in percentage of reading performance. <coughs> that means that 11% of kids who weren't meeting standards in 2011 are now meeting or exceeding those standards in 2013. That's the kind of growth we hope to see. And that's where the data, I think, is most useful, is growth <coughs> of students over time. We also can look at the data by what are called subgroups. Subgroups are percentages of students. They're defined under federal law, um, under No Child Left Behind law, that we're required to report on. Different categories that, that we report on include students with disabilities, students who are um, socioeconomically disadvantaged is the title of the cohort group. Those are students who receive free or reduced lunch. We report on students of different ethnic um, groups. and. That may be, a, oh, limited English proficient um, students who are our English language learners. So if we look at reading in grade five, we can see that 89% of the students in that grade level met or exceeded the target for reading. But if we look specifically at the cohort of students with disabilities, and that's a smaller percentage of that total group, only 50% of those students are meeting or exceeding um, the targets. So again, for us, as we looked at the strategic plan, one of the focus areas is really improving the performance of those subgroups, those cohort groups who aren't yet meeting the performance standards. This is an illustration of, of that point. We also look by gender. Um, this year's writing performance data was particularly significant with respect to gender. Um, while 58% of our students overall in grade five met or exceeded the target, only 42% of our boys um, in grade five met or exceeded the target as compared to 76% of our girls. That's a pretty significant gap. Now, it's not an uncommon gap. Um, gender gaps in writing are pretty well documented in research and in literature, but it's significant enough of a concern for us um, that we have called in some support um, uh, writer, educator, um, author, researcher, Ralph Fletcher, um, who writes a lot and speaks to um, the issue of gender gaps in writing, is coming to work in the district on the 27th, I believe, of March um, with our teachers across grades three through nine um, at, to really begin that dialogue about what's, what's going on, what are some of the differences that we see. And I can elaborate more on that, but I may save that for... Um, a follow-up topic because I think it's that important. Um, there is a gender gap as well in grade eight in the writing data, but it is not as significant. That gap closes by more than, um, it's about a 20 point closure of that gap um, over those three years. And at the high school level, my recollection of the last SAT data, and I didn't um, grab this before I came in, into the meeting tonight, was that the gap was really only about five points <coughs> in writing. So by junior year, that gap is closed fairly significantly, but it is, it is concerning to see this level of a gap um, at such young ages. So now what do we do? We look at the data. Um, Pond Cove and the middle school have both spent time in faculty meetings looking carefully at the data, thinking about what does this mean? Um, 
we look for patterns, we look for some trends, we look to see what our relative strengths and weaknesses are. Writing, again, for us has been an identified area of weakness. That's why we focused on writing, um, writing program at Pond Cove, particularly this year. Why we're looking to expand that in the strategic plan into the middle level for next year. We also want to know what this tells us about our curriculum and student learning, our students learning what we, what we think they should be learning. As we look at the item analysis, meaning the reports of individual questions that are on this test and look at student responses, as we look at the student writing pieces, what questions do we have? Does this match our instruction? Do we want it to? Do we think our instruction is better than some of what the test is asking? And in some cases that may be true. Um, and then now, as we shift to um, a new focus, how does this assessment data inform us about what to accept, expect from the Smarter Balanced Assessment? And I thought about walking you through some of the questions on a Smarter Balanced Assessment. Again, I think I may save that for a workshop um, meeting, but I think that's a useful exercise. Um, it would be a useful exercise for members of the board to go through to see what kinds of questions are asked and to actually walk through a sample test in, in um, one of the content areas at a particular grade level to get an understanding of, of how, um, how the expectations are shifting. Um, we're also working right now to align our curricula with the Common Core Standards. And that's what will be assessed by Smarter Balance. Again, those, those were sort of newly adopted. NECAP began to incorporate some of those standards into its questions this year, but it was really a small percentage of the total um, testing questions. And then professional development. What do we need to focus on as we move forward? Again, writing is an area that we've already identified and we want to continue to provide support to. Doesn't mean that we're trying to match up necessarily with what the testing is requiring, but we want to think about if other, if students across other districts across the state are performing at a particular level in writing, what's different for our students? We need to look carefully at that. We know that we have great writers who emerge from Cape Elizabeth, but we want to make sure that all of our students have the opportunity to become great writers. That's, that's it, aside from taking any questions you might have. Meredith, um, you know, I believe the research shows when school districts or school communities, uh, at a, even the state level, change in assessment, um, you know, there can be dramatic changes in, in scores and uh, there's a tendency you want to compare the kind of scores from one assessment, one methodology to the prior year. Um, and obviously, you know, parents are, you know, look at these scores. Um, so as a preemptive communication to the, to the public, maybe just talk a little bit how, um, you know, they should frame or understand that the assessment's going to change and why the scores may change. Right. dramatically just because I think that'll be a concern of, of, of parents. Well, Smarter Balance is, is fairly uncharted territory. There are a couple of states who have piloted those exams this year or in the last year and a half we've seen fairly significant differences in student performance between their prior state assessments and the Smarter Balance assessment. So we anticipate that we'll see some changes. We are just beginning um, really in Maine to incorporate all of the Common Core standards into our curriculum and instruction into our everyday work. Um, we know that there are cases where those assessments are asking students to go deeper. There are some cases where we believe we're already exceeding some of the common core standards and that's, that's great news for us. But it's a very different kind of assessment for all students beginning in grade three. It's a computer adaptive assessment. So they're answering all the questions in, on a computer as opposed to the paper and pencil test booklets that they've dealt with in the past. So that in and of itself is a change. Um, we also know that it's a learning curve, so we expect that we're going to go through an assessment. Again, we hope we'll be well prepared for it. We've, we've, we're learning about it. We're trying out those pilot tests. We're understanding what the expectations are. Um, but we're going to see what our baseline data is, and we're going to see what baseline data is in other parts of Maine, around the United States, and say, hmm, you know, here's where we are right now, but here's where we think we should be as we look at the assessment, as we look at the standards. So I can't tell you that, that we're going to have 80% of our students or 85 or 90% of our students meeting the Common Core, the Smarter Balanced Assessment expectations. I can tell you that, that we will see what develops and we will set goals that we think are um, 
challenging for our students and our community, and we will work hard to achieve them. And as a follow-up to that, um, you know, you may have a child uh, that, you know, in second grade, you know, was proficient with distinction or proficient, and then this coming up year, they may, you know, it's a different system, a different scoring. So um, I would just encourage the, the school board, which I can encourage myself, but uh, the whole school community to, to start uh, reaching out to parents. So when you get these changes, you know, if, if my child was did X amount last year, this year it's different, I just think it would be help uh, frame, you know, some of the considerations and why they, they might be, may or may, may not be comparable, because I'm sure it's uh, an issue all schools will face, but I think it's something we know now that we can start reaching out. So when the score, the assessments are different, that, that parents understand uh, how these changes may be impacting. And I will add to that that, you know, the district is implementing this year some universal screenings through pilots this year. We've budgeted to implement those um, for next year. We also are holding on to the NWEA assessment, the Northwest Evaluation Assessment that we use at the middle level. We have a number of assessments that we use in reading, um, for example, at Pond Cove. Those other assessments will continue to be in place because what's important for us is not looking at one data point, you know, in a snapshot, because it might be the best day that you've ever had for an assessment and it could be the worst day. You know, some days we just do not perform at our absolute best. So to put all of our eggs in that one basket around one assessment on one particular point in time wouldn't be in the best interest of students. So we want to really be able to sort of triangulate the data. How's the student doing on these other assessments that we're doing? How did they do on this particular smart and balanced assessment? And how are they doing in the classroom on a daily basis? Because those are the pieces of information that really inform who the child is in the center. Thank you very much. David? Um, I assume all, all towns in Maine are going to be using the Spider Balance test? Yes. Will all schools in New England? Uh, well, all schools who have chosen to participate in the Smarter Balance Consortia. Okay, I'll just ask Massachusetts, Connecticut? I believe that they are both participating in Smarter Balance. So, to follow up on Michael's comment, what we used to get in the past was, and I've always thought it was a mistake to simply compare ourselves to Cumberland, Yarmouth, in Falmouth because we compete against everybody in this country, never mind in the world. So uh, putting benchmarking other main towns is not necessarily the correct benchmark. So I would hope that when we do this in the future, we benchmark ourselves. We, we had a couple, uh, a school in Massachusetts we had a relationship with, which was comparable in size, socioeconomic, right. et cetera. We ought to do that again. And secondly, when the parents look at this, if we have correct data points <coughs> with our peers in Maine and with other ones, that's the correct way to measure what we're doing versus an apple to a rock test, which is what this is. Correct. I mean, right now, NECAP is used in New Hampshire, in Maine, in Vermont, and Rhode Island. Massachusetts has its own assessment. Connecticut uses another assessment. I mean, you, you really can't make the same comparisons because the tests are constructed in different ways by different groups of people valuing different standards. So the Smarter Balanced Assessment has, I think, 24 or 26 states participating across the country. Um, there have been groups of people from across those states developing the assessments based on the information and the standards of the Common Core. So just to encapsulate it, it's better for us to compare ourselves against our competitors in Maine, our competitors where we can find them of comparable towns. Under this new system, we have now more tools to do that, and uh, we should not go back in time. We should just, you know, compare now, next time we do these tests, with th these comparable schools. Right. I, I think we'll have greater opportunity to look at comparable schools. I will say it's not entirely clear how that data will be shared. returned and shared and how each state may choose to utilize that data. Each state is still paying into the Smarter Balance Consortia and whether each state will pay for the same level of data tools to be able to work with the data, I, I can't answer. But the possibility exists that we'll have a better way to gauge what we're doing in, in the real competitive environment our kids exist. That's certainly the hope. Okay. Okay. Meredith, can you speak to um, today in this seat, you know, where we are right now, if when a parent opens up the, N, the 
the rapport and see is it partially proficient, what's the best thing that they can do um, to advocate for their student or to get more information right. about what's going on in the classroom? Yeah, I, I, I think my first call would be to my child's classroom teacher to initiate a discussion about here's what I've seen on this assessment data, what does it mean, can you help me understand it, how does this relate to other data that I see about my child, um, is this is this where she or he is performing on a consistent basis as I talked about sort of across that triangle um, and if it is how can we work together as a team to help my child's performance improve if it's not how how can I be confident that the performance in those other areas the performance in those other two data points or multiple data points uh, outweighs that how, how can you assure me that I don't need to worry about this isolated data point and if the parent doesn't agree with the teacher that in her in her his or her observation that they're doing great in the classroom just had a bad day or sure. um, what do they do next if they don't agree with the sure. parent I mean, I, or the I, teacher? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our teachers are wonderful resources and great for dialogue. I think, you know, you always work through those kinds of conversations. Conferences are coming up, so I expect there'll be lots of conversation. I would say if if there are ongoing concerns after a conference that parents should you know, reach out to school administration or the guidance department in the Great. school to continue the dialogue. Um, uh, you know, I, That's great. we care deeply about the performance of, of children as parents and as educators, we care deeply about the performance of children. So to, I don't think people on either side should worry that because you may not see eye to eye that that's, that that's a conflict. It's, it's an opportunity to learn more about one another's perspective and hopefully, again, I think both people come to the table with the best interests of the child at heart and um, it's important to have the conversation. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, I just have one, Meredith. We, this is not the first time we've seen um, poor writing scores. I don't know whether I should call them alarming, but but they're very different from the other scores that we that we see in reading and math. And the the district has had a literacy focus for three years now, and I know that some special attention has been paid to writing in the latter part of that. Can you um, remind us a little bit about what what we're doing in the district around writing? Sure. Um, the writing focus really shifted this year. This year is the first year that Pond Cove, um, through last year's budget process, requested um, training and support for staff using the Teachers College Writing Program, which is a reading, excuse me, writing workshop model, um, which really is saying we want students writing more frequently and across different genres. And that's really the emphasis. I mean, what we've, what we've seen and observed in the past is that our students had less experience with what we might call informational writing um, than they had with sort of narrative structure, telling stories. Our students had a lot of practice telling stories, but we recognize that the expectations for writing performance have changed. Um, so that's, that's the work that's been going on this year. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a, well, as I think I've mentioned in the past, we have a consultant who's coming in and working with us, um, working in classrooms with our Pond Cove administ administrators, um, with Ruth Ellen Vaughn, our curriculum director, to um, support teachers. We've given teachers release time to really work on building those units, having the professional conversations. Um, our teachers will be looking um, collaboratively at student work to really assess student performance and have shared expectations about what writing should look like. Um, that work will continue into next year. Our fifth grade teachers are already um, visiting some schools using Reader Writer Workshop. They're talking with our fourth grade team. Um, they have the opportunity this year to sit in on the lessons um, when our consultant is here and to visit classrooms. Um, so we expect to expand that work into grade five next year. And then we also are, again, bringing someone in to talk with us about the gender gap. Um, because we think it is significant and we think it deserves conversation. Um, and we'll, we'll see what, what happens with those initial conversations to determine what the plan is to address, address some of those concerns moving forward. But I think the first step really is to talk about it and recognize it and, and think deeply about what's different um, and how we can support our boys in becoming 
strong writers and seeing some of the strong writing talents they have. One of the, one of the things that we see in boys' writing is that we often praise in education narrative structure as great writing. Boys don't always approach writing as young learners with typical narrative structure. Um, so, that, so that's one of the challenges. They also might choose different topics um, than, than, than we are sometimes comfortable with or have historically been comfortable with in schools. And they might want to write about fighting. Um, and, and boy, we shy away from that in schools. Um, so having some real dialogue and conversation about that I think will be important. Thank you. Don, I have one more? Yes. Meredith, I know that, will you just talk again about the, um, I think our cohort of uh, students with NIS, can you, can you just tell me again, how did we do from last year's, I, I missed that, and I think I heard that we did the, it was, will you tell, me, will you just go over that one more time? I can. I didn't speak about the cohort overall. I shared results of um, particular grade level, fifth grade reading performance for our students with disabilities. Now our students with disabilities aren't reported as a cohort at every grade level in the data that we receive because to, to exist as a cohort you have to have above 11 students in your group. In some grade levels there are fewer than 11 students identified with disabilities. That doesn't mean that we internally, however, can't look at that data carefully and really examine that performance. Um, overall, we know that there's a significant gap between the performance, again, this is generalized, yes. but between the performance of our, of our students who aren't identified with special educational disabilities and our students who are identified with educational disabilities. So that's a gap that we've identified as something we really want to address. Um, we have targeted some professional development around that. And uh, again, I think that's, it's an area of focus for us as we move forward. Great. Thank you. Seeing no more questions. Um, One more. Suzanne. Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. It's not really a question. It's more of a comment. Just coincidentally, today at the um, MSPA meeting, uh, we were reviewing grants um, from teachers, and one of them, um, which is looking for immediate approval, is um, a grant for um, the telling room to come in and have a four-day workshop. What, what, we're, what they're trying to work out is, is, you know, what grade levels and how to identify which groups of students to receive the, um, the training. But it, uh, which I think is a great um, grant proposal, but also I think it speaks to, you know, the, the parents and the parent associations, um, how we can also contribute um, to supplement in different creative ways, um, whether it's outsourcing or our own ideas. I would say that grant coincides with Cape Celebrates Literacy and this right. year our theme is telling our stories and so again I, I, Ralph Fletcher who's coming to work with faculty across grades K through 9 on the 27th of March will be emphasizing that that piece as well but I, I, I think that's the piece as adults we can model yep. for all of our children but for our boys in particular that how to go about telling their stories and giving voice to their stories and pointing out other stories written by boys and young men. Again, boys' liter literary tastes, and this again is a generalization, um, but statistically research shows that boys are, tend to be more interested in nonfiction. Um, and we historically in schools have taught a lot of works of fiction. Mm -hmm. That is improved, I would say. We strike much more of a balance now than we used to do. Um, particularly at the younger grade levels, but, but that bias in our culture still exists. And if we really want to help our boys grow as writers, then we need to honor also what they want to read. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Meredith. Moving on, uh, why don't we move to item she's five. She's ready? She's ready. Oh, five she's ready. Eight. All right, then we're going to move up to item 5A. Um, our state representative is here, Kim monahan Derrick, I think. She is. She is. Um, to, I think that's the name. To honor our uh, girls soccer team and the, as well as the mock trial team. Thank you for being here. And I think our athletic director, Jeff Thorak, and 
soccer coach Andy Strouder here, um, along with captains representing the girls' soccer team, and then um, Coach Mary Page is here um, representing mock trial, along with some students from the mock trial team. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Senator Rebecca Millett sends her regrets. She wishes she could be here, but she's up in Augusta. Um, and I apologize for sort of disrupting the flow. Um, I rushed out and forgot the sentiments, and so we had someone drive it down who, coincidentally, she lived in Portland, so it wasn't such a bad drive. But we're here today uh, very proudly, very happily, to um, honor the um, Cape Elizabeth High School Class B soccer team, as well as the, once again, Cape Elizabeth High School mock trial team for the fourth year in a row, I understand. So um, first, I would like to present the, um, our, our legislative sentiment for the uh, high school girls soccer team. So if you don't mind, I'd like to read it. And if you girls want to come up and or if everybody wants to come up and so at some point get their pictures taken, we can do that. Um, State of Maine, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth High School girls soccer team on its winning the 2013 Class B State Championship. We extend our congratulations and best wishes to the members of the team on their achievement and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be set forthwith on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the great state of Maine, signed by Justin Alphon, President of the Senate, Mark Eves, Speaker of the House, Derek Grant, Secretary of the Senate, Millicent McFarland, Clerk of the House, and it's sponsored by our Senator Rebecca Millett of Cumberland County, myself, and Representative Scott Hammond, who represents a little part of Cape Elizabeth. So congratulations. Here, and at some point, then we'll do the mock trial, and then we'll get our pictures taken. And the next legislative sentiment, again, goes to the um, Cape Elizabeth High School mock trial team. Be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, re uh, join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth High School mock trial team, which has won the 2013 Maine State High School mock trial championship, the fourth year in a row that the Cape Elizabeth High School team has won the championship. The team will represent Maine at the National High School Mock Trial Tournament. We extend our congratulations to the members of the team on their winning the state title, and we send them our best wishes on their future endeavors. And be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the great state of Maine. Um, this was given up last week at the state capitol uh, in Augusta, and yours was... Uh, developed, I believe, printed up in December, but I understand we had to wait for a little while. But in any case, this is signed uh, by Justin Alphon, President of the Senate, Mark Eves, Speaker of the House, Derek Grant, Secretary of the Senate, Millie Monks, oh, I'm sorry, Millie McFarland, the Clerk of the House, and sponsored by Senator Millett of Cumberland County, represent myself, and Representative Hammond of South Portland. So again, congratulations to the 2013 Cape Elizabeth mock trial team. Uh, and, and, is there, uh, Kim? Yes. Could you possibly separate the two since not that I don't Absolutely. care about care about the soccer sure. players, they did a great job, sure. I do care about anybody, the mock trial people. Else want I'm to sorry, the soccer team rocks, David. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As does the mock trial team. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Kim, and congratulations to both the mock trial team and to the varsity soccer team. 
work very well done. We will move on then to item 5D, the superintendent's report. Okay. So we've just recognized a couple of teams. We have some more to recognize in the near future. Our speech and debate team won this championship. One of their coaches, Lisa Melanson, is here in the audience this evening. Our Special Olympians weren't able to join us tonight, but they are going to come um, in April as well. And then our girls alpine ski team also are state champions this year. So we will um, be inviting them all to join us for the April school board meeting. Let's see. I think that's it on that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Cape Celebrates Literacy is kicking off um, on the 12th of March and concludes on the 12th of April with Author Fest. So far, we have over 30 authors and illustrators from across New England confirmed to come back for a second year. So wow. thank you to um, Cameron Rosenblum and um, Elizabeth Johnston and Amanda Kazaka and uh, Carolyn Young, who have um, been sort of leading the troops on coordinating some of those efforts across the district. We um, will see visits with those authors and illustrators going on in our schools, generally Skype visits for many of them, prior to their visit. So there'll be a lot of those visits over the next month. Um, the Thomas Memorial Library is also working closely with us on Cape Celebrates Literacy. It's a joint effort. It's not a school-only proposition. Um, and they're hosting, um, actually on the 18th of March, one of our students will be speaking about, who has come here from Ukraine, will be speaking about sort of her experiences, telling her story, um, following the theme of the month. This week is World Language Week. Um, Cape Elizabeth Middle School is celebrating and focusing um, right now on the country of China. So I, I will have the opportunity to speak to some middle schoolers on Thursday. Um, the instructor from the University of Southern Maine who teaches our after-school Chinese program um, is also working um, in some classrooms this week. They're doing some exploratory activities and learning about China's culture, language, and history. What else? Draft calendar coming around. This is the board's first look at the calendar. We're we're a little behind schedule. I think we shared a first draft with you in February last year. We were delayed, though, in our approval as we were waiting for some more clarification from the state of Maine around the changes that had been made requiring our calendar to align with the calendars for regional vocational programs. Um, we have heard, and Susanna, um, I think, can confirm this, but we have heard that um, the current Commissioner of Education will support those calendars not being common, provided that we can maintain um, the required number of instructional hours and that districts continue as we have done, um, commit to make sure that our vocational students have the opportunity to attend classes anytime that we are not in session but the vocational program is meeting. And we have traditionally provided transportation um, on those occasions. So this draft is um, out for public feedback, I am meeting with um, faculty tomorrow. I've received a number of comments from faculty who've seen this draft, um, well, since sometime in late February. And um, I welcome feedback. Folks can send it to my attention at the superintendent's office if they have um, concerns or to my assistant, Andrea Fuller, who will make sure that I see it. We have proposed in this draft two full weeks of vacation. Um, in December, December into January over that holiday um, break. This year we wound up with two full weeks due to snow days, um, but a number of districts surrounding us had taken the full weeks because of the way the, um, the vacation falls. Um, coming back to school on the 2nd of January being a Friday doesn't necessarily seem like the best use of instructional time. So um, a couple of other differences, we've reduced the number of professional development afternoons based on faculty feedback, that's still a topic of discussion, and added a, another professional day um, to the calendar. Other than that, it's, it's fairly consistent with calendars that you've seen historically. February and April um, vacations remain intact and school starts after Labor Day. I do have a couple of questions about the calendar, and I don't know if this is the forum that you want to take those in, but I'm, I'm noticing that in April, Friday the 17th, before the holiday, is that a new 
practice for us? That is not a new practice. That is a comp day, typically for our teachers around conferences, and it has been a no school day since, okay. since prior to my arrival in the district. Um, and then in the teacher days um, box over in the lower right hand corner, you have one teacher day in April, so that must be the 17th? Yes. Uh, that's a, again, that's considered a, a, a comp compensatory day for our teachers for the time that they invest in conferences in the month of March. Okay. And then um, in that same box, um, there are teacher days, there are eight of them, two of them on Mondays. Absolutely. Yes. So the professional Mondays are 70 minute after school sessions that our teachers spend working in professional learning communities on different curriculum topics or other. Um, professional areas. The high school this year is focused quite a bit on proficiency-based um, reporting and assessment. Um, so the teachers spend those 70 minutes after school and the accumulation oh. of those 11 Mondays times the 70 minutes is, is another two full days. Okay. That's what that means. Oh, because I was looking for the blue box yes. on the calendar. That's Correct. not going to be there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, comment about the two weeks in December. I, if we had had the, if we had not had the storm, and we had the two school days, I was prepared to ask for attendance data because I actually would support the two weeks are based on attendance data, which I never got to ask you for. <laughs> So, but I think you know where I'm going. I understand where you're coming from, but you would expect attendance to be low in the district had we had school on those days because many families are traveling typically during that, that longer period. What I was thinking. So I hear you. All right. Um, I'm sorry, Meredith. I'm not sure where to bring this up or who. Um, but under what uh, forum would would it be discussed to have? increase school days to add beyond the 175 mm -hmm. would that be in a budget the upcoming budget meeting or to put it forward to certainly could or? be i think it could be a request for a new agenda item um i would say that's probably the appropriate forum and to put it on for a future business meeting discussion okay okay um, all right are there any other questions about the calendar Thank you, then Meredith for sharing I just this have, draft. Yes, I just have briefly done. a couple other things okay, that I, I didn't mean to segue into no, calendar no. and leave them off. Um, the high school's performing Dead Man Walking. You heard that, well, the mention of the One Act Festival. Um, so there are additional performances on the 17th and 18th, or 18th and 19th, hmm, somewhere in that vicinity. I don't have. My battery died, so I can't look at my calendars to tell you that specifically. Um, and this Thursday night is our high school band and chorus concert. So if you are looking for something fun to do on a Thursday when we don't have any snow, please come out to the concert Thursday evening. Um, I also had the opportunity to visit a robotics class in first grade last Friday, along with Principal Hassan and Evan Thayer, who's a high school teacher who's been our robotics K-12 robotics coordinator this year, was working with a first grade class, um, essentially looking at um, scientific principles for young ages, but they were using gears and levers and building um, windshield wipers was one of the tools they were building, and claws. And I wish I had one to show you because my action isn't quite as exciting, but they, they had to figure out how to pick up an object, like not having the arms flop from side to side, but actually work together um, to be able to move what? things around. So really beginning um, conversations around scientific principles, good problem solving. The kids were very engaged, to say the least, and um, very enthusiastic. And um, it's nice to see that building. I think I'm done. Thank you for that. All right, uh, on to item six, new business. Uh, the letter A, may I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve a mock trial team trip to the National High School Mock Trial Tournament in Madison, Wisconsin, May 7th through the 11th, 2014. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? David. Uh, just a couple of clarifications um, on the forms that were submitted. Um, it says, do all members of the group team have an opportunity to participate? It's a little bit vague. Technically, the national rules only allow seven kids to actually compete in the tournament. Um, 
uh, and they've been a timekeeper. Uh, they did, for the first time this year, open it to allow us to bring as many kids as want to come as observers who also participate in strategy and so forth. So this year, we actually have a much larger group going, depending on how many people ultimately sign up, it's anywhere from 15 to 18, which is a tremendous opportunity for kids. Um, so just to clarify that, but also explain that although they don't get to technically participate in the actual trial, they do get to participate in the strategy, they do get a chance to observe it. it, it it's a great opportunity for them. And secondly, um, because there is so many people going and they are trying to raise funds to do it, there is a couple more things listed on there. There is now a Facebook page, okay, for Elizabeth Mock Trial team, and it, embedded in there, one of our team members created, I don't understand it, but some way that you can contribute money by clicking on something. So I would ask the members of the public to consider, you know, visiting the Facebook page and, and the, uh, 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 whatever this thing is, the way you can contribute money. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Item B. May I have a motion? Yes. I, I, oh. Go ahead. Michael. Uh, I move that we approve a high school boys tennis trip, team trip, to Vandermeer Tennis University, Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, April 18th through the 25th, 2014. Second. Second. Thank you, Joe. Um, is there any discussion? And Coach Strout is here if there are specific questions that we need answered. Does anyone have any questions for Coach Strout or any discussion of the trip? David. I just had sort of the same question with the mock trial team. Is everybody that wants to go able to go, or is it limited in some fashion? It's not limited at all. Great. I think that's a very good thing to have. Thanks. Yes, I, I did have a follow-up, uh, and I apologize. Um, it's for, we have one school staff and zero chaperones. Is there typically <laughs> two adults uh, on all trips? The, the ratio in the policy is really depends on the age level of the students and the number of students participating. So one chaperone is consistent with the participation level for this trip. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? All those in favor? 7-0, thank you. Uh, letter C, may I have a motion? Um, I move that we consider to adopt the 2014 school board goals. Uh, sorry, C. One ahead of us. C. Oh, I already checked it off as we were done. Do you want me to do, you want me to do it in order? Well, Lisa wants to go. Yeah, on. yeah, let's go, let's go in order. Sure. Um, I consider we approve the proposed um, EF tour to Greece in April 2015 from Lisa Melanson. I didn't mean to skip you, Lisa. <laughs> uh, David. Uh, I'll second. Wait a second. second. Okay, um, thank you. It, and also incorporate the fact that it's set forth in the attachments to the, uh, our agenda. Are you amending the motion? Yes. Okay. It's done correctly. Uh, is there any discussion? Yeah, um, in the packet it has an overview of um, the, the tour, um, but I didn't see any approval. Typically they're approved by uh, kind of the department or the administrator, so I, I didn't know if this was... So the timeline is such that it's really a preliminary approval? This is a preliminary approval. Typically when we have tours that are going overseas or that are at this sort of price point, um, we try to give that notice well ahead of time so that students have an opportunity to fundraise um, if they're interested in attending and um, to plan and save for that trip. Um, it also lets us make sure that things like passports are in place for um, long journeys and you would be asked to if um, participation numbers are sufficient to then approve the final details of the trip sometime next year. So is it fair to say this is a approval to see if there's going to be a trip enough? Adequate interest. Okay. To yes, 
Perfect. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I led my first tour in 2007, and since this would be my seventh trip. Uh, and the interest has ranged from about seven or eight up to 23 or four. Uh, so I can't really say how many I will have, but I do have um, male and female chaperones, myself and my husband, lined up. So uh, at least we can accommodate that. And in the past, we've also included uh, students from Chevrus uh, and my colleague and her husband who works at Chevrus have um, lined up students from there, and that's been a nice experience too. So really, I open it up to students from Cape Elizabeth. Um, you're welcome to come. Thank you for taking the time to plan these trips. Thank you very much. Thank you. David. Um, Thanks, Michael, for pointing out we didn't have a, I would like to amend the motion to, I think we're basically approving the consideration of a proposed EF tour to Greece as opposed to the actual tour. That is accurate. Are you comfortable with that? I'm comfortable with that amendment, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there any more discussion on the am amendment, or the, on the motion as amended? No, there's not. No. All those in favor? Seven. Okay. Uh, Can I do D? Yes, no, please. I consider, I move that we consider to adopt the 2014 school board goals. Uh, is there a second? Second. A second. Okay, so um, the school board met uh, in retreat a couple of weeks ago to, as we do each uh, year in the beginning of the year, um, we delayed that meeting a little bit this year in order to um, have more complete information about the objectives and initiatives um, that are central to the strategic plan um, so that that, that long-term strategic plan could be central to our um, goal setting for um, this year for us and a school board year is a is more like a calendar year than a school year uh, because we we focus on um, when our membership changes over which is in december so we're we're looking at um, our goals for uh, the year the calendar year 2014 um, and uh, we worked for three hours to put together um, goals that that were focused on um, moving the the district forward um, in ways that we think are exciting. I hope um, uh, th th Elizabeth and I then worked after the meeting to try to um, consolidate the work that we had done into a, into a set of goals. Uh, I hope that we've captured it all, but if we have not, um, now's a good time to let us know. The only thought, um, and it's covered by et cetera, in, uh, Goal number nine, continue to explore districts, topic during workshops and business meetings. I just wanted to make sure we talked um, a lot about the math curriculum. And um, I, I assume that's in the vertical cur curriculum alignment. That was, that was kind of my addition, my hope. Yes. Yeah. Vertical curriculum alignment really hits. But we've been um, talking uh, math for a, a few years now and just want to make sure that is that's on our on our list i think that's the piece that captures that yes david uh one quick question um proficiency based diplomas thank thanks to joe's enlightening me on this massive topic um that may be something unless we get a waiver that's going to have to be done now as opposed to workshop it it literally will have to be done and in place for next year. So I just, I just want to not, I wouldn't necessarily change the order, but unless we get a waiver, it has to be completed. It's not something we can workshop, it's gotta be done. And it may even change our budget, it could, it could change a lot of things. It's just learning you to. Right, and we have some flexibility in terms of how, whether we address that in a workshop format of, in terms of what, or at a business meeting. Um, but um, it's, it wouldn't be, um, the board's work so much to be developing the, the, the 
the mechanism for the proficiency-based diploma, but this is an opportunity for us to hear more about that work. And I've already asked um, Ruth Ellen Vaughn, our Director of Instruction, and Principal Shedd to speak to that at the April business meeting if, in fact, um, the board wants it on the agenda at that time. But they'll be prepared to speak to it as early as then. I appreciate it. I was just trying to make the distinction that unless we get a waiver, we have to adopt one, not just discuss it. We actually have to prove it. That's, I just think people in the public should be aware of that. I hopefully we'll get a waiver, and I know Senator Millett's working on some other things to try and help us. But that is a phenomenal uh, area that I was completely dense about until Joe pointed out to me in our last meeting. But there's a lot there. Is there any other? There is another um, question. And you forgive me if I've um, glossed this over in our retreat, but also part of our strategic plan is to close the achievement gap between those who are um, achieving less in our school district. And I'm wondering if perhaps adding to one of the workshops or um, adding a separate workshop or adding it into one of these suggested workshops would be um, an overview of instructional support in RTI and how that's working in our district? So we had, I, th I think where we hope to address the specifically the achievement gap issue was in um, the item, can't find mine, but the item that, um, that gets to the, the strategic plan goals update. And, and Elizabeth, I've condensed that. Um, you know, that may be more than one event. Okay. Um, in other words, it may become part of regular business meetings to hear updates on different aspects of the, the strategic plan. Um, but that's where that goal was captured for me in here. So I can read into the strategic plan goals update district PCMSHSIS? If, if you believe that what you're referencing is captured by a strategic plan goal, then yes. OK. If you're trying to get at something that's broader than that or different, then, then it wouldn't be there. No, that would be exactly what I would try to get. OK. I can, if you don't mind, share with you um, the reason the wording says district PCMS HS is that's the way it's framed in our in the strategic plan. Okay. And so I. Instructional I, support is incorporated under the district, district heading in the action plan part. Okay. Just as long as it ends up getting covered in one of these workshops. Yes, and RTI is included in each of the schools, so. And like last year, there's a lot of material here. Only some of these topics will eventually be full evening workshops. Other topics will be um, opportunities to ask um, members of the administration team to, um, to speak to the board uh, on, on, in certain areas on, uh, during regular business meetings. So is there any other discussion of school board goals? No? Okay. All those in favor? Seven. Letter E. I have a motion. I move we approve the job description for district technology coordinator. Is there a second? Second. One attached. Uh, is there any discussion? In reading through, um, through it, I just wondered, are we at the level in the education certification, uh, certification, I'm sorry, um, the bachelor's degree, uh, and then we, we say master's degree preferred. Um, at this, because it just seems to me they would need a master's to be able to do this huge work for the town and the um, school system and so I, I guess I just questioned why we would I would say our experience um, when we filled the position a couple of years ago was that there was not a large candidate pool applying for those positions so we want to have some flexibility okay. um, we want to obviously make sure we have a person who is skilled and capable um, if that person doesn't yet have a master's degree it doesn't preclude them um, from applying and being interviewed and potentially being offered a a position. 
Um, and we know from our experience with our educational staff that we have wonderful, great um, teachers who are not yet in possession um, of master's degrees. So I think it just was to give us more flexibility. And that has historically been the qualification. And then I guess the other piece was then we really are paying for a master's degree through would, would that um, that person would be eligible for course reimbursement under the terms of the administrative bargaining unit i just guess when i uh, point that out and see um that's our standard operating yeah i mean i i think our goal is to find the best candidate um for the position and um you know if it's the most uh, the most highly qualified candidate but qualifications may or not may or may not be strictly a degree of education right Exactly. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Down at the end of the, of the uh, bench, are the you in favor or opposed or I hands are up. She's just serving me water so I don't spill it. All right, 7-0. Thank you. Um, on to F. May I have a motion? Uh, yes. Uh, I'll do this as a slate. Uh, I move that we approve the following athletic extracurricular staff nominations under item 6F as listed in the March 11, 2014 business meeting uh, agenda packet. Second. Thank you. David. I, I think we discussed carving out approval of at least five positions because there's not a uh, amount of hours or a rate or what the stipend would be. That would be Greg Marles, uh, B.J. Nickerson, Elizabeth Yarrington, uh, Charlie Carroll, and Chris Bagley. I don't see how we can prove somebody for a position. We don't know what we're going to pay them or how many hours they're going to work or anything like that. I did notice those are all, the ones you listed are all booster funded. Uh, positions. Doesn't matter. Our job is to approve their hours and their funds and required by federal law to oversee it and approve it. Those are school positions. Do you want to speak to that, Meredith? I would love to speak to that. I think at the time that all of these people have been recommended by the athletic director, they've all been um, vetted with respect to qualifications, criminal background checks, all of those pieces. I think the question that wasn't clear at the time when this um, submission was received from the athletic director was exactly what the stipend funds might be available from the boosters um, for some of these positions and therefore what some of the specific hours might be. So I think it's fair for the board to wait for that information. Um, and that's why, because I don't, I don't question the quality of these people because we have information. I just quite, I think it's incumbent upon us if we're going to prove a position, we know what we're paying them and how many hours they're going to work. All right, I'll, I'll amend it. Uh, I move that we approve the following athletic extracurricular staff nominations. Andrew Wood, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Andrew Gway, Joe Henriksen, uh, Jeff Perkins, Sally Newhall, Ben Raymond, David Croft, Doug Worthley, Andrew Lupin, and Andy Strout, Sarah Beckel, sorry. Uh, ben Putnam, Kevin Stilton, Joanne Bear, Peter Esposito, Per Norris, Paul Wellman, Christopher Drake, and Russell Thompson. And you missed Joe Hendrickson? And uh, Joe Hendrickson. And Steve Martin. Steve Martin. I can't believe Steve, Steve Martin. Martin? Why, why did you do it the long way, Michael? Just exclude the five I mentioned. In any case, um, all those in favor of the, of the uh, motion as amended. Thank you, Michael. So we will uh, take up the, those other five folks at, the, at our next business meeting uh, when we have a little more information about the stipends. Um, item H, may I have a motion? I move we appoint David Hillman and Joanna Morrissey as representatives to the Cape Elizabeth, uh, um, yeah. Representatives to the Cape Elizabeth Educational Administrators Association Negotiation Committee. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is there a second? I second the motion. It, is it just us two, John? Two yes. of us? 
You didn't tell me that when I signed on. I didn't. Is something wrong with that, Dave? No, I just think that we need we need a massive team, like a, you know, five people or something. I'm kidding. Are you comfortable with the with yes, the I am accepting the nomination? Just have a little fun. <laughs> I think we got the two toughest people in the school board here. It's fine. <laughs> you're, you're the titans, right? So. Um, David, from you, that's the highest compliment. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, is there any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Uh, Joe and David, thank you very much for agreeing to serve. My pleasure. Yet again. Um, all right, item seven, committee reports. Do we have any committee chairs who would like to make reports? Uh, I'll, yes, I would. Thank you, John. Um, as you had mentioned, the uh, budget process uh, workshop schedule is available on the website the next meeting is March 18th um, as you know and as the superintendent highlighted and I highlighted at the last meeting there's several remaining uh, unknowns including health insurance premiums uh, state revenue amounts as well as um, uh, current teachers negotiations uh, on an unfortunate note we received a preliminary estimate from the state um, for our revenue number and for those who follow the school budget, this is a prelim preliminary estimate and can change dramatically. Uh, but despite the state shifting costs to local school districts, which they did last year, um, Cape Elizabeth will receive 3.5% uh, decrease in the state revenue allocation, um, which is a significant change uh, and impact on uh, the revenue. So. Um, I do encourage citizens uh, to reach out to our local legislators. Um, as many of you know, the state had agreed to fund uh, approximately 55% of the education in the state of Maine. Uh, they have not done so, and at the same time, they're shifting cost uh, to local districts. So, um, like I said, this is a preliminary estimate, but it's definitely going in the wrong direction, and I would encourage you to reach out to your local representatives and we'll update the school board and the community um, further on this item um, but just so everyone in the community is aware that uh, the revenue we're receiving from the state or the state subsidy is uh, preliminary number is down three and a half percent um, which is which is unfortunate but we want everyone to know that and we'll update the community once we get a final uh, revenue number thank you Michael David um, to follow up on Michael's, um, I got the same thing he did, and I think it comes out to about $86,000, Michael, uh, less than we were expecting. It's eighty-three-three. dollars Okay. Uh, less than we were expecting. And I, I have sent off an email to our state reps asking them about this. There was some attempt to... There's apparently a $9 million hole, it was a $9 million hole, and trying to get clarification on whether this uh, is going to exist, is it going to change, is there something in the works, exactly what's going on. I haven't had an answer yet. I, I assume Rebecca and ours is still up there, but we are trying to track it down. Thank you for doing that. Are there questions for Michael or if none, are there other committee chairs who want to make a report? Um, I would like to say that the policy committee does continue to barrel through its policy manual. Um, as stated in our Cape Elizabeth 2014 school goals, we will complete the review of our policy manual this coming year. Um, our next meeting, I'm jumping to the upcoming uh, meeting announcements, will be uh, Monday, April 7th at 7.30, and I expect the agenda will be heavily taken upon our substance abuse policy, among others. So please stay tuned for what policies we will be reviewing. We are anxious to get as much community feedback on our substance abuse policy as possible so that we can get a policy that reflects the values and that of our community. Thank you. Do you have an expectation on when, when you'll have a next draft? of that policy? Well, we did send our policy back to our um, attorneys for further review, given the, um, the 
the use that that policy does have and the importance that it places in our community and, you know, quite frankly, the, the hot topic that that particular policy is. And we want to make sure that um, what we do have meets a certain legal standard as well. So um, when we do get that draft back from Dunman and Woodson, which I'm hoping will be before our next meeting, um, we can sit down and review that again. I suspect it will go back out for a first read after the policy committee reviews the edits from Drummond and Woodson. Okay. Yeah, th that would be my hope too, that we would have a chance to see it before that yes. meeting. Yes. So that... Before the policy meeting? Before the policy meeting. So that... I'm, a, I'm yeah, expecting that when the policy packets are sent right. out. So that... Okay. Great. Um, Kate? Um, not as a chair, but just as in the teacher evaluation committee. Mm -hmm. um, We've met about four times, great, uh, very nice meetings that Meredith is uh, co-chairing with, will you help me with the? the Sarah Harrington, high Sarah, school um, social studies teacher. Which is very kind of Sarah to step up to do, uh, chair this um, committee, which is an 11 person committee. Uh, Mm, 18. Exactly. Thank you. Closer. And then the other piece about the committee that's uh, exciting is that the state, help me with this as well, Meredith, puts on um, dine and discuss nights at the university, at USM, that we can go and hear about other people's, how they're doing with their evaluation committee. Kelly's been at all of them, Meredith, myself, and other members of the team, so that we have a we can see what other people are doing, and they talk, frankly, what goes well and what doesn't go well. So it's a, it's a, um, a great forum. Um, and it's sponsored by the University of Southern Maine, but the state has supported it by um, sending representatives to help inform about the expectations of the law and um, the rules that are happening. <coughs> and that's mostly, that's the <coughs> most um, Bless you. Uh, lively debate about the law and what the state will is uh, putting forth in, in the dime discuss. That's it. All right. Thank you. Um, item eight. Are there any requests for school board agenda items? I heard earlier Susanna's request to discuss the length of school year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to add that for future discussion. Okay. Any other requests for future school board agenda items? No, you can always send those to myself or to Meredith or to Elizabeth um, when they come to you. Um, so item nine, uh, in terms of upcoming meetings, um, the first thing I wanted to mention is that we did um, discuss at our retreat uh, dedicating some more workshop time to the strategic plan. Um, we didn't settle on a time, but um, w w I'm proposing to use the, uh, the Michael's storm date on uh, March 20th, Thursday, March 20th, uh, in the hopes that we won't have to use that for budget, but that it's already um, blocked out of your calendar, um, that we could use that evening to address the strategic plan. Does that, so if, if everybody's preliminarily comfortable with that, you can let me know if you have, I don't expect you to tell me right now if you have a conflict, but if, if that seems okay, let me know if you have any conflict with that. But otherwise I'll assume that people are okay with that date because we had already put it on our calendars. And hopefully we don't get snowed out of one of our budget meetings between now and then. Um, in terms of other upcoming uh, meetings, Michael's already mentioned the budget meetings on the 18th uh, and the 25th and potentially the 27th if we do run over. Um, are there any other meetings people want to mention, Joe? Sure. Um, there's also the Cape Elizabeth the Services Advisory Committee meeting coming up on um, next, oh God, I wrote it down, but I forgot the date. Next Wednesday, the Community Services, Services Advisory, Advisory meeting. Committee meeting. No, not the 24th. Let me look. Next up. Wednesday would be the 18th. No, I'm sorry, the 19th. Right, Tuesday's the 18th. No, but it's not that. It's not. Okay. Sorry, guess again. I'm sorry. Hold on. 
But you can also find it on the you website. You can find it on the website, but um, I do encourage all those interested. It's actually, I'm sorry, on Wednesday, April 2nd. Wednesday, April 2nd is the Community Services Advisory Committee and meeting. And that's in the Community Services. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Kate? And then the library, Thomas Memorial Library um, Building Committee is meeting with uh, on March uh, 20th at 4 o'clock at uh, Thomas Memorial Library library with the trustees and the board and it's an open meeting for everyone to discuss and um, the architects will be there if anyone's interested in the building piece of the Thomas Morrow Library. Thank you Kate. Any other upcoming meetings? All right item 10 may I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. All those in favor? <laughs> All right. It's been a long day.